Take what you tell us and better now it's cooler. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, make, make use of the facilities. I say, if the weather's this good, we kind of foolish to stay inside. Yeah, yeah use the grass. It's even better. Seven o'clock, let's kneel down and pray to our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament behind us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. Saint Francis de Sales, pray for us. Saint Peter Chanel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Welcome everybody to our second class. And um, I took the obvious step today. As everybody says to me how hot it is, I just thought, well, it's not hot if you're in the breeze and you're out of the sun. So this is in the breeze and it's out of the sun, so it's an awful lot better than sitting inside. And this was washed in, uh, not a lot of air circulating in there. So let's get straight to our work. We are into chapter three of our book, God the Supreme Being. Remembering that two weeks ago, we covered first of all religion and the end of man, that uh, man's destiny is heaven. Man's destiny is supernatural, it's above this. Our destiny is not just to be here, and if it is our destiny to be only on earth, it's a pretty miserable future that we have. Okay, we live in the valley of tears, and we wish to go to a place of unending happiness. So our end, the end of man, the place that man needs to go to in his life is eternity. And that is with God, and that God has set up an order whereby uh, we need to praise Him. We owe God. God does not owe us. 
we owe God. And so through religion and the organized religion that God has set up, we give more praise to Him than we can on our own. And then we went into the Apostles' Creed, uh, those articles, those 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed. And today, we start with God, the Supreme Being, which is the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Okay, so, we, uh, as we go along, if you have it, if you, I hope those of you who have the book have read it or um, seen what we, the stuff that we're going to go through. And if you have questions, as usual, put your hand up and I'll do my best to enlighten. Who is God? It's not what is God, it's who is God is our first question. God is the Supreme Being. Infinitely perfect. Okay, so he meets the job description of being a God. One being infinitely perfect. Who made all things and keeps all things in existence. You remember last year I put up the, uh, a lot, two weeks ago I put up the timeline where you have the first second here and then the timeline starts off. And if we were to go on that down that timeline, which goes on into infinity, from that very moment when God created from nothing, God created from his own will, he wished to create something, and by his own will, that thing appeared out of nothing. At that moment, time begins. Because time needs space, and it also needs it also needs things to be around because if there's no things there is nothing to time of. It also needs to have a lineal dimension. It starts here and then it moves to the next place. So if there's no thing, there's no lineal dimension. Until God has created, there is no time. So before time, God. And God doesn't have a place because no place has been created by him. He is just existence itself. Which is why he answered Moses, what is your name? Who are you? Who shall I say to you? I am who am. In other words, I am existence itself. So, we start off with God is the supreme being. Therefore, there cannot be another one. There's only a or the supreme being. Supreme means all. Absolutely all encompassing. And a being means that he has existence. So, existence itself is supreme. Nothing can be alongside it. Nothing can be above it. God is absolutely, in that sense, supreme. And therefore, infinitely perfect. So there's no end. Infinity, the sign of infinity, there's no end. It just continues. And, it's, and he's perfect. So there can be no shadow, no question in God. God is absolutely perfect in all way, shape and being. And he made all things. So this idea... From here, God created ex nihilo, from nothing. God, just by his will, there's nothing to put it together with. We can say, oh, this artist is very creative. Okay, but the artist is using things that are already there. A canvas is already there. A paintbrush is already there. Paint is already there. But God creates from nothing. We find that extremely hard to conceive that nothing can become something. But God, creating from nothing, brings things into existence by His will, and therefore the fact they are there is because of His will. If He were to shut His will down, they would stop existing. That's us. Okay. So God brings our souls into existence. Because the moment before our conception, our soul was not there. He didn't pull our soul off the shelf. He found the soul up here. I'm going to put this one into that body. There you go. Now he creates it from nothing. And so for that very reason, it is existing because he willed it to exist. By the same reason, he can will for it to not exist. But, as we read in the book of Genesis, God created the earth and he saw that it was... God created the sun and he saw that it was good. God created the animals, he saw that it was good. All things he created, but when he created man, what did he say they were? Very good. Very good. And because he saw that they were very good, God will not wipe away 
what that thing that he has created. These souls are going to live forever. Because God saw they were very good. They are created in his image and like this, not like the grass, not like the tree, not like the birds. And for that reason, the scripture says that our souls are infinitely above the other creatures. They are worth so much more in the eyes of God. Sorry if you are a, an animal lover or something, but the human soul is so much above any other thing that God has created because it is in his image and likeness. Number one. God made everything, men, beasts, plants, planets, stars, everything. Not only that, God keeps everything in existence. As I said, the fact they came from nothing is from his will. The fact that they remain means that he wills for them to remain. Were he to take away his hand, meaning his will, from what he created, everything would disappear into nothingness. We can't even conceive that nothingness would just swallow. It would not be it would be more than a black hole, because a black hole is a thing. Whereas God would just make them absolutely and utterly disappear, and he will not do that. Okay? Um, without a cause, there could be no effects. Without God, could there be anything at all? Of course, the answer is prior to here. It was nothing, only God. So without God, nothing can exist. And the scriptures say in Acts 17, 28, In Him we live and move and have our being. So that's that existence that we have. They use that word being, which is a very uh, theological word. A being or existence. I'm going to give you the Latin word, not just because I'm trying to show off, I know some Latin, but the Latin words are often the way that the, we get essence in English, of course. And so the essay or the being or the existence of a thing is the way that St. Thomas Aquinas constantly uses this word or often when he's talking about his summa theologian, the sum of all theology, theology God, St. Thomas keeps talking about the essay, or the, the whatness of something. It's being, the fact that it exists. Okay. In him we live and move and have our being. And then in, in the letter to Colossians, in him were created all things. Come on around, or come around, sit on the grass, whatever you want. It is he who gives to all men life and breath and all things. So once again, this reiteration in Acts 17, 20, this reiteration of this idea of something's existence comes from God. And the scriptures are repeating this to us to remind us. Number two, the traditions of all nations and races support the idea of the existence they would offer. Why would someone destroy their own produce or creatures if there's no supreme being that all these ancient races did it god has put that within us it takes an effort it actually takes an effort for a human to hold to atheism they need to actually work on it to try and put out what is within them the idea that something else has existed of course people will say they'll, they'll use other words but often they are pointing to the fact that they do believe in something uh, existing outside of themselves even among the wildest, most remote, and most degraded pagans, there is invariably found the worship of some deity, recognized as supreme, on whom man depends. There are savage peoples without ruler, laws, or even settlements. I think we call them Westerners. <laughs> but never without some god that they worship with prayer and sacrifice. So th these two ideals, prayer and sacrifice, are uh, one of these universal things that nations have been doing for centuries upon centuries that people pray to something and they sacrifice to something and this has been we know this from ancient history and ancient history is very clear about this we see altars amongst ancient civilizations without any hint of christianity or judaism there but there is always this idea of prayer and sacrifice prayer is a word you'll find in many ancient languages Okay, it is accepted as one of these uh, points. 
What do we mean when we say that God is the supreme being? When we say that God is the supreme being, we mean that he is above all creatures, the self-existing and infinitely perfect spirit. Now, do those words sound a little bit tricky to anybody? Does that make sense? When we say that God is the supreme being, we mean that he is above all creatures. Creation beginning at point A. And therefore the supreme being stands before them. So therefore he's above all creatures which begin at this moment because they are created. And that means anything. That can mean ants, that can mean microbes, that can mean elephants, that can mean planets. They are creatures because they are created things. Okay, that makes sense? Right, so therefore he is self-existing and infinitely perfect. It goes on and on and on. I am the first and I am the last and besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 6. Okay, so the prophet Isaiah and the prophets speak that which they have been passed on. has been passed on to them by God. And the prophet Isaiah, who has predicted many, many things in the, in the centuries to come, stands as probably one of the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And he makes this very clear by speaking the words of God, I am the first and I am the last. That means, that means before creation and even after time, when time is finished at the end of the world, God is still there. And besides me, there is no God. There's only one. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is coming. In other words, all time is encompassed by God. Everybody understand the meaning of Alpha and Omega? Okay, the alphabet of Greece. In the ancient times, the Greek alphabet was used in the Mediterranean area. So covering Israel, Palestine, North Africa, and all of Europe, the Greek, uh, ancient Greek language was used amongst all people. The first leader of the alphabet was Alpha, the last letter of the alphabet was Omega. And that's why you often see that symbolism sometimes in churches. Alpha, Omega, A and O in English. And that's the first and the last letters of the alphabet. And it's just, just a metaphor for saying, right at the beginning, right at the end, I am, I can encompass all things. Okay. That's for the book of the Apocalypse. So what is a spirit? I've been using this word, it is a perfect spirit. What is a spirit? A spirit is a being that has understanding, free will, but no body and will never die. So, understanding, free will. Spirit. The Latin word for spirit is, anybody? Really hard. Spiritus where we get the word from. Okay, so, the spirit, understanding, free will, important is this point about the understanding and the free will because when God creates man he says let us create man in our image and likeness if God creates us in his image and likeness how am I standing here have I got bare feet today if I'm in his image and likeness obviously he's not referring to that part of God he's referring to the spirit which is the understanding and the free will. Every single one of us has a free will. We have varying degrees of understanding, even as we grow, as we start from, from youth. Children, as you know, if, if you've had children, you see their understanding grows by day. They see things differently from the first day to the second day, the week to the month to the year, and they keep growing and growing and growing, as do we throughout our lives. So we have this understanding and our free will makes us decide you by your free will have decided to come here tonight understanding that you want to learn something so mirror God in that you have his understanding and you have free will that is part of the human spirit but because we have a body we are different 
to a pure spirit. We have a spirit and a body. A spirit, another word for the spirit, of course, is soul. And so you can use either spirit or soul, they're interchangeable. But we have a, a body and a soul. Okay, but a pure spirit, understanding, God understands free will. God decides to create because he's free to do so. But God has no body. A body needs a place. Okay, and a body therefore goes through time because a body stays in a place and it moves through time. God therefore without a body does not stand in a particular place. So other creatures that are spirits, they have to have understanding and free will, no body. Any other creatures? Angels. Okay, God created angels. The book of Apocalypse tells us that God created angels. Now there are two groups of angels, good angels and bad angels. Those, they were all good to begin with. Um, or some of them fell to the bad angels. They're still angels. They have angelic abilities. That means they have understanding, they have free will. We'll get to that later on in the book, explaining about how angels function and how they work. Right. God is a pure spirit. He has no body. When we speak of the eye of God, the hand of God, we speak only in a figurative manner in order to make ourselves more understandable according to our human way of thinking. Because we are talking about God's hand was able to move the waters. We think of a hand. But it's just a part of God whereby the waters would be divided. Let's say the Red Sea was divided by the hand of God. So you can see this big hand coming down out of the clouds. <laughs> because our way of thinking can't imagine how God's will can move water. So metaphorically speaking, the scriptures and people, when you talk about the hand of God, it was touched by the hand of God. God doesn't have a hand. Okay? Um, our Lord said to the Samaritan woman at the well, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Yet God is often taken on visible forms. God sometimes has to take on a visible form for us to be able to have a chance in order to be seen by men. Therefore, he showed himself in the form of a dove at the baptism of Jesus. So at the baptism of Jesus, we had the first ever real showing of the Trinity. Okay, we had the voice, a sound from heaven of a human voice speaking, God the Father, because he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Then we had the son who, in whom he was well pleased. And then we had the descent of a bird. And therefore the Holy Ghost takes the form of a physical being in that sense. So God can teach man by that way. Um, and in the form of tongues of fire on the Feast of Pentecost. And we know that at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and rested upon those who were in the upper room. The Twelve Apostles and the Blessed Virgin Mary. So how did the Holy Spirit come down? In this case, it was like tongues of fire. That came down and stood above each and every one of them, not burning. That's happened before in the Old Testament. Anybody know when tongues of fire didn't burn something in the Old Testament? Burning bush. Can't hear it? No, it's the burning bush. The burning bush on top of Mount Sinai. Okay, so God represented by that burning bush. Again, that fire comes down in Pentecost, so the representation there. God is not a dove. God is not tongues of fire. He merely assumed those forms in order to be seen by our mortal eyes. Angels and devils are pure spirits. Men are only partially spiritual. And that's one of the ones I love when I say to someone, oh, so are you religious? And they go, no, I'm spiritual. It'd be very hard for you to not be spiritual. If you were not spiritual, you'd be dead. There'd be a corpse there. There's no spirit in it. So therefore, you're not alive anymore. So I'm spiritual. Okay. Um, men are only partly spiritual because they have a body. Man's soul is a spirit absolutely independent of matter and by creatures indestructible. Okay. So those few words there. Absolutely independent of matter. And by creatures in the strut, independent of matter. Sound weird? Theologically odd? Man's soul is a pure spirit, 
Sometimes we got to try all pictures in order to try and, to try and understand some of this. of conception, the beginnings of the body are made by uh, the cells from both the man and the woman. And when those two fuse together at that moment, God creates the spirit from nothing. Now, that spirit doesn't have any matter. Matter is something which is actually physical. that can be seen, touched, measured, weighed, whatever. The soul is absolutely and utterly independent in that way. But God has made it, created it, and put it inside that body. Even though it's the tiniest of cell in its infancy, as it grows, the spirit doesn't grow, but the spirit stays in there. The spirit informs that growth. Okay, so it grows because it is alive. The life force, we could call it. The soul is the one that was created by God. It is this unmeasurable part. It is, it is the you of you. Even though you are independent and different from everybody else by your, your face, your cells, your DNA, all that is totally independent because it's you. But the soul is the one that is actually you. But as humans, we are this mixture of the two. That's what we are. We were created like that, but when we die, no one's died yet, no one's ever known what it's like, that soul is going to leave. And when it leaves, since it's never done it before, that's where our fear comes from. We don't know what's going to happen. It's, we've never done this before. Oh, I went for a jog last week. Now I know what it feels like. It was hot. What does it feel like when that soul comes out? We have no idea. The two have never, ever been separated. But the soul continues to live. Because, how would it be killed? If you get a knife and stab my human person here, it's going to go right through the soul because the soul doesn't have any material. It has no matter. It can't die. God, however, can take away his finger from it and it disappears. And that way it's no longer in existence, but he doesn't do that. He's the one whereby it exists. And he's the one whereby he says at this moment, this body's not working very well anymore. And it's breaking down, and it's breaking down, it's breaking down. And as a doctor would say, any minute now, it's not going to be able to keep going. The soul is still there. And the moment that body gets to its point where it cannot be sustained or it cannot sustain itself anymore, by any certain way that it is, then that soul is going to leave that body. Where does it go? It goes right before it's made. He made it. It's got to return to him. Okay? So it's independent in that way that it continues to live. And the idea that I, I use there, it's independent of matter. It was, it was put into matter when it was created, but it can go independent of that matter. The matter will grow, the matter will die, matter meaning the material of the body, and then the matter will rot. And will, in the end, it will just be dust. Because thou art dust, and unto, unto dust thou shalt return. God made us from things that were already in existence. After all, if it came from our parents, that it was already in existence. But God was the first one to make that. So totally independent of matter as a soul, and it is indestructible by creatures. No creature can, can destroy that. And that includes angels. They're pure spirits, but they don't have the ability to destroy another spirit. They didn't make them. They were made themselves. And how do you destroy something that doesn't have a body? Good luck. Try it. What are you going to use? Nuking it. Okay, so the independent spirit is not 
it's no, it's no, once it becomes free from that body, it's not held in anymore by the body that it was made in. It goes before God, of course. But think of, let's say, something like an angelic spirit. An angelic spirit is not held in by physical body. If an angelic spirit wants to be here now, as there are numerous, I can't see them, but they are all here. So there's all these angelic spirits here now. If the angelic spirit wanted to go to the sun, because it needed to go to the sun, it would go sun and it would be at the sun. Because the distance between us is created and it doesn't hinder them. They don't have to go through time. It's sort of the, the time in order to get the distance. Because for them they are spirits and they would just be there. They can't be in two places at the one time. They're not omnipresent. They can move right across matter. Therefore, they can move from here into there without having to go around through the door. It won't take any time to get there either. They can't be in two places at the same time, but they can go from one place to another instantaneously. As Christ did after his resurrection, even with the body. Okay, we get to that one later. Any questions on the independent of matter and cre by creatures indestructible? Yes. The scriptures say, after death <coughs> comes the judgment. After death comes the judgment. And all the fathers of the church, the early writing fathers, all of Catholic theology, all says, at the moment the soul departs the body, it is judged immediately by Almighty God. So it doesn't sort of hang around. Well, there's ghosts in here, Father. It's people who were here once. After, after death cometh the judgment immediately. And once the judgment has been settled, then the soul is going to go to one of the two places that it has been allotted by God, either into damnation or into um, bliss. And that bliss might have to take a bit of cleaning to get there through purgatory. We get to that in many other later chapters. Is that okay? Right. And that's at least the way that it has been interpreted by all the theologians. The moment of death, judgment. Otherwise, if there's no judgment right at the moment of death, that means you can still do things and therefore you can still merit. You can change. You would be able to see things. Oh, what was I doing? Oh no, I'll be, I can now. But God's not going to do that. God's given us this life to get it right. As he says, you know not the time nor the hour. Make sure you do it now. He doesn't say, you're going to get another chance later on. You're going to do it now. As he says, otherwise it will be too late. And God, Christ often speaks of those who there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they left it too late. In other words, it's got to be done by the time the soul leaves the body. As spirits, God and men have this in common, though in different degrees. All have understanding, intellect, and free will. So the intellect, let's just say a, a, a part of understanding. An intellectual being is one who can understand concepts. Um, by his free will, man can even defy his God, his creator. Right. It does not owe his existence to any other being. That's self-explanatory. Everybody agree with that? By self-existing... He does not exist because another has put him into existence. He exists before anything else. God made us, but who made God? That's one of the old questions. God said to Moses, I am who am. Exodus 3.14. Okay? That I am, I, I am, I am who am. He exists of himself. Prior, it's hard for our minds to sort of understand that deriving his being from no other. So his very essay does not come from another because he is essay. He is being. He is existence. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Um, God is the first cause. That's a, an, an Aristotelian uh, concept of cause and effect. God is the first cause. From a cause you have an effect. Okay? The cause could be to open my fingers and I would drop that the effect is that it's on the ground. God is the first cause. All other things come on after him. All effects come because of the first cause. All other beings and things owe their existence to God in comparison to him. Make clear of that. In comparison to God, we are not. Because our existence is due entirely to him. Man can never have a complete knowledge of God. 
even in heaven, man cannot have a complete knowledge because God's infinite and we are linear. We exist in time. Even when we get to heaven and we see God as he fully is, oh, it goes, it goes on, does it? It keeps going on. And then that joy of knowing more about God will just go on and on and on. And then when we think, wow, this is incredible. I've seen so much. And then we realize we haven't even begun. It just goes on and on. So we can never fully know infinity. And that would be one of the great joys of this happiness that goes on and on and on and continues. Man is finite and cannot fully understand infinite. Remember basic math there. A cup of water can contain the immensity of the ocean more easily than man can fully understand God. We will never be able to fully do it. We know God only partly from the order and the harmony and from the existence of things. From our conscience and from God's revelation. So there are several points there that we can know bits about God from those, those few points. What do we mean when we say that God is infinitely perfect? Well, we say, when we say God is infinitely perfect, we mean that His perfections just don't have any limit. It just keeps going. We see the perfection that is in front of us, and then it would go on to the next, and go on, and go on, and go on, and go on. It would never, ever end. Psalm 144, God is immense and eternal, an ocean without a shore or a bottom. And the reason they use that, that analogy is because people stand up at the end of land and they look out to an ocean and they go, wow, there's no end. But God is the ocean that does have no end. So again, using metaphor, because we have the idea of how big an ocean is, we can stand on the shore and we can look out and go, wow. But there's no shore on the other side with God and there's no bottom to it. It's just that idea of unendingness, immensity. Uh, the unchangeable being that only himself can fully understand of his greatness, there is no end. Number one, God is so great and wonderful that he needs nothing to make him greater or more wonderful. That's our first thing. He needs nothing to be more great. Nothing. He is all. It's all contained within him. He possesses all perfections, countless, innumerable, illimitable, boundless. Now look at those words there. One, two, three, four. Those last four words. Countless. It's a negative word, isn't it? Countless. Innumerable. It's a negative. It's a negation of numerable. Counting is ability. Countless means you can't count. Innumerable means existence of things from our conscience and from God's revelation. So there are several points there that we can know bits about God from those, those few points. What do we mean when we say that God is infinitely perfect? Well, we say, when we say God is infinitely perfect, we mean that His perfections just don't have any limit. It just keeps going. We see the perfection that is in front of us and then it would go on to the next and go on and go on and go on and go on. It would never, ever end. Psalm 144, God is immense and eternal, an ocean without a shore or a bottom. And the reason they use that, that analogy is because people stand up at the end of land and they look out to an ocean and they go, wow, it has no end. But God is the ocean that does have no end. So again, using metaphor, because we have the idea of how big an ocean is, we can stand on the shore and you look out and go, wow. But there's no shore on the other side with God and there is no bottom to it. It's just that idea of unendingness, immensity. Uh, the unchangeable being that only himself can fully understand of his greatness, there is no end. Number one, God is so great and wonderful that he needs nothing to make him greater or more wonderful. That's hard for us to get. He needs nothing to be more greater. Nothing. He is all. It's all contained within him. He possesses all perfections, countless, innumerable, illimitable, boundless. Now look at those words there. One, two, three, four. Those last four words. Countless. It's a negative word, isn't it? Countless. Innumerable. 
It's a negative. It's a negation of numerable. Counting is ability to count lists, means you can't count. Innumerable means you can't number it. Illimitable, you cannot limit it. Again, it's a negative. Boundless, there's no bounds to it. Again, it's a negative. St. Thomas Aquinas said, in order to be able to put words to God, you have to use the, this thing called the via negativa. The via is the way, the road. The via negativa is the only way you can actually put words to God. It's no good just saying number. Without number is a lot of, okay, it's just without number. Innumerable, there's no number there. So the via negativa is actually the only way that our brains can put words to that which goes on forever. So St. Thomas Aquinas brought it into us, this idea of the, um, the via negativa. God cannot be better. He cannot be holier. He cannot be more perfect than he already is. He is the acme of perfect perfection, the uncreated, the infinite. Heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain these, says the book of Kings. Number two, so perfect is God that he is infinitely incomprehensible. Again, another negative. Comprehension of something. God is incomprehensible. Cannot comprehend it fully. Incapable of being completely understood. Reason can verify, so make sure or, or uh, check the revelation that God made of himself. But when we make our reason or our emotions the final authority, we make ourselves our own God. Which is where we get not only atheism, but all the derivatives of atheism, agnosticism. It's our Nosos, our knowledge, which becomes the God. Nosos, nosos is the Greek word for knowledge. Gnosticism with a G, that means the ability to think or to, to have this idea of because I think, therefore I am. And therefore, Gnosticism is that idea that says because I know, therefore, well, I know I am. I'm making myself a sort of supremeness. The ability to know things, therefore, puts someone that knowledge is the highest of all things. But how limited is our knowledge when it comes to infinity? Just a little drop in the ocean. We're so weak in that sense. Um, we make ourselves a final authority. We make ourselves our own God. And we shut the road to the supernatural, the infinite. So remember, when we're talking about this, this is spiritual but God is even above this, because God created it. This is natural to us. That's on the level of human nature. What about above that? The supernatural. We talked about that two weeks ago, the word supernatural, above nature. So when we, when we put knowledge as the being and end of all things, well, knowledge can't understand that alone. Knowledge can certainly not understand the creator. So knowledge, therefore, limits our ability to understand the supernatural, this, this uh, Gnosticism. We have to therefore have a second degree, and that's the ability to be able to have faith. Um, God alone can bridge the chasm that yawns between the finite and the infinite. We are finite, he is infinite. Between finite and infinite, there is, as the book says, a chasm. Only he can cover that gap. When we take advantage of his grace to seek him, which he gives to all of us, in loving trust, he holds out his hand. It comes down out of the clouds again. There it is, the hand of God. A father calling to children, which is why he uses these metaphors. The father in heaven who wants his children to come to him. Or as Christ would say, I am the shepherd and you are the sheep. The sheep are extremely stupid. The shepherd shows them the way to go. So he wants to lead us around to cross the chasm safely to him. Number three, the creator is above all the created Though something of him, some likeness of his being, there it is, some likeness of God's being may be found in every creature, in varying degrees, of course. But even were all creatures from the most glorious seraphim to the lowest of moss to combine their powers and their perfections, theirs would be a faint shadow of God's all-encompassing supremacy. After all, it's all just contained within his will. It doesn't even scratch the surface. 
God's perfections do not exist separately in him, but are one and identical with himself, because they are all infinite themselves. They are only various manifestations of his one nature and his perfection. In God, for example, his goodness is one with his wisdom, because his goodness is infinite. And his wisdom is infinite. And his power is infinite. So they're all just one within God. They're not sort of separate pockets of God. His perfections, besides being one and the same in him, are also identical in him. That is, God himself is infinity, wisdom, goodness, power. Questions? And then we'll stop for a short break. It's a lot easier this week than it was two weeks ago. These were all sweet. Alright, so it's it's lofty thinking. It, 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 for anybody, is this going beyond? Is this getting a little bit too hard? I'm, I'm trying to use as many words that can be understood in there. Everybody's nods of assent. There's no... Who does Logos fit into all this? The Word. Yeah, yeah we get to that in later chapters. The Word of God. It's God's willingness. Put on from him. Any other questions? Alright, let's take five minutes. And... Um, Start up in five minutes in the next chapter. Yeah. Well, it's over there if anybody needs it. C269 is your code. <laughs> Funerals and weddings. As regards to time, so God is eternal. Therefore, outside of time, He is creative. God had no beginning. There never was a time when there was no God. God can never cease to exist. He will have no end. He will always be living, immortal. So therefore, God fits the job description. If people say, if people often say, oh, you're God, 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 but often we have to make the distinction when we're writing, if we write this, as opposed to that, they have different meanings. God with a small g, God with a big g. Okay, God with a capital G is God. Meaning he fits the job description. He had no beginning, he had no end, he will always be, it's always in existence. This one is someone's idea of a deity that perhaps had a beginning. So when the Greeks talk about the pantheon of Greek gods, plural, okay, and Māori certainly attribute certain things to certain gods, plural, what they are often talking about is something that they don't have the words to be able to explain, and they give that as an attribute, or well, this is the god of thunder. How do we work out? How does that noise come? It must be God, the god of thunder. And often, um, this has been able to be uh, explained as, in some sense, the attributes of God or caused by God because God creates the weather. God creates matter. And these things come from God's creation and humans were often never able to explain them. However, with fallen human nature, people just started to make up more gods. And it got to the point where the Romans, they couldn't keep up with all their gods. There were too many of them. And they just had this pantheon and they would have temples to the unknown gods. Okay. A silly idea, go into a temple and offer sacrifice to the God you don't even know anything about, but it's the ones that we don't know, we know the other ones. So after a while, when humans get to run with these ideas, humans are going to end up making mistakes, whereas God makes none. So when people are talking about, and that's right, when in the psalm that I read before, there is no gods or God other than me, that's with the small g. When God says there's none other than me, that's with that small g, that's what you are making up. When people make their body their God, or their food their God, or their drug their God, or their pleasure their God. It's all this. That's what I'm seeking for. I'm seeking for that 
particular thing. I'm putting all my energy into owning money. Putting all my energy into the power. That's their goal. Because that's their be all and end all. That's what they are aiming for. And in the end it becomes their demise, their downfall, because they're facing in the wrong direction. They're facing in limited, not eternal, temporary. That which is going to end up disappointing. Whereas the eternal can never be that disappointment because it goes on and on and on. Um, there is no time with God. With Him there is neither past nor future. Everything is present. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, as a thousand years as one day. P2 Peter 3.8 Before the mountains were made or the earth and the world was formed from eternity into eternity, thou art God. Psalm 89 I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay, so I have to use a very weak sort of picture in order to, or an analogy to talk, sort of explain the idea of God and time. We'll get into it a little bit further, but uh, so if God begins before time, God, God is already there before time. How then does God operate? with regards to 756.54 on the 29th of January 2018? It's a philosophical question. Okay? We exist right here and now. If I was to say, instead of 756, 6.56 on the 29th of January 2018, we can't go back there. It was an hour ago. It's happened. You may have been sitting in the same way, but it was not the same. You're now an hour older. You're an hour closer to death. You're no longer the same. You're no longer there. And you're also not at 8.57 on the 29th of January 2018. That's an hour in the future. You don't know what you're going to be doing then. You could be in a car somewhere. You could be talking. You're not there. You're here now. Hick et nunc. You're right here, right now. But what about God? Okay. Think about this. God's the one who created time, how is God then in time if he created it? You start to see where theology starts to get kind of difficult for our mind to understand that. So, let's look at it this way. Here is the beginning of, t of existence of things, time, right there at the number one, where God begins to create, and then it goes on into infinity it will just keep going on forever now god created that there was a time when time did not exist so to speak so before god created anything there was no time but god was already in existence so in a sense i'm going to downscale this and put it here one to infinite infinity which will go on forever this is the creation of god all time is existing in here from the beginning of time into infinity but god is there before it god is there after so to speak so therefore we look at god as this outside of time not contained within so, as I talked about, it's now 8 p.m., the 7 p.m., the 8 p.m., and the 9 p.m., how does God see those 7, 8, and 9 p.m.? Does he see them as we are now at 8 p.m.? Well, yes, he does. He sees 8 p.m. right now as it is now. But God also sees 7 p.m. right now as it if it is now. And God sees 9 p.m. right now as if it is now. Why? Because he's outside of time. And he created it. So let's go and put Adam in here. Let's put us here. And let's put the last human being before the earth ends. They're all there. God is seeing us now as we are right now. But God is also seeing Adam as if he's in the garden right now. And God is seeing the last right now. 
Now this is going to open up a can of worms that you're going to go, no, but what about this and what about... We get to all of those. The idea of predestination. God knows if you're going to end up in heaven or hell. Oh, but, 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 and these are the questions that keep going on and on. We get to them. Don't worry. Today I'm just, now I'm just talking about God and his perfections and time. So God exists outside of time. It is all the same time for God. If you are praying for Auntie Shirley who died a few weeks ago, God's hearing your prayer now. But also at the moment that she's dying, he's hearing your prayer from then in the future. If you're praying for your ancestor who died 200 years ago, God is get, hearing that prayer right now, but also at the moment they are dying. Time doesn't worry God, which makes us sort of get the idea of the efficacy and the wonder of prayer that you can pray for someone across time and space. Because for God, it doesn't matter. It's all the same for God. He's outside of time. He sees all time right here and now. Make sense? Yes. Good. There are many other can of worms. I don't, I'm not even going to try and open it because it just goes on and on and on. The questions start getting... Well, we get into them as the book goes anyway. All right. God will always remain the same. He is the Father of lights with whom there is no change. God cannot change. The God that is God now is the same God that has ever been, the same God that will ever be from and throughout all eternity. The Father of lights with whom there is no change nor shadow of alteration. After all, what could change God? God can't change his mind. He knows all things already. He sees all things. He created it all. He knows it all. Oh no, I shouldn't have done that. It doesn't exist with God. He's outside of all of that. What do we mean when we say that God is all good? When we say that God is all good, we mean that he is infinitely lovable in himself not even with relation to me just within himself he is all goodness and therefore is lovable that which we love which the thing which is good and that he and that from his fatherly love every good comes because real goodness is diffusive okay diffusive means it goes out from itself the thing which is good will go out onto others god is all goodness and therefore his goodness is part of what has created us we are, we are in existence because of God's goodness. He doesn't need us. We can't change him. There's no change. He's all good. If good comes out of itself. God is himself love. Love is a part of his nature. Compared to God's infinite goodness, the goodness of man is nothing. And that would make sense, wouldn't it? Considering that God's goodness goes on forever. If we have some goodness, it's just tiny. And our goodness is not always there, as we know. But God's goodness is always there. Um, the goodness of man is nothing, only the shadow. Men, creatures of God, are good because God made them to his image and likeness. Remember that? God's intellect. God's free will. That's the image that we have. And therefore God created us good. Which is the mirror of him, the image of him. Is that over here? Alright, <laughs> so, oh, taste and see that the Lord is sweet. Out of his goodness, so coming out, that diffusive part, out of his goodness, God created angels and men. Because of that goodness, the willingness that God, well, we'll get to the reason why, but out of his goodness, God created angels and men, although he had no need for the angels. Remember, he's gone out here, already infinite, even before anything has been created. When you're infinite and you're God, you're not lonely. You're perfect. You have no need. There's no desire. You're infinite. So God, out of his goodness, has decided, I'm going to create creatures. And a varying degree of levels of creatures. But the highest of the creatures will be the ones in my image and likeness. Angels and below them, men. I'm going to give them intellect. I'm going to give them understanding. I'm going to give them free will. And that will be my image. And therefore, that's why he created me. He saw they were very good as opposed to good. He had no need of us. His creatures, God loves his creatures far more than a mother loves the children that she has born. Far more. As many mothers get quite ticked off with the children that they have born. Whereas God loves us far more. Because he knows every single bit of us. 
He created us for his own glory. We'll get to that. God gives us the beautiful world to live in. He takes care of our body and soul. He showers benefits and graces on us day after day. He prepares us, prepares for us a place in heaven. Above all, he sent his son down to earth to die for us. Right, so a quick little aside here. Immediately someone could say, oh, well, if God looks after our body and soul, what about the child who has cancer? How long does, has someone had cancer for? The maximum. 100 years, maybe I doubt it. Until death. And then what? Then infinity begins. And the cancer, in a thousand years after they die, looks very, very small. A million years after they die, it looks almost nothing. Compared to infinity, it is nothing. The length of our life is as a blink of the eye compared to all of creation. So we need to have the sense that sufferings on this earth, and we'll come around to that eventually, they all work towards us reaching infinity. They're all just part of the challenge. It doesn't mean it's easy for anybody who's got these things, but God is in control in all these things, and we need to have that essence and that, that idea of God in order to be able to bear these things. What do we mean when we say, oh, so God gives us a beautiful world of showers, benefits, prepares for us a place in heaven. After all, he sent his son down to earth to die for us. That's how much he loves us, to show us. What do we mean when we say that God is all-knowing? Well, when we say that God is all-knowing, we mean that he knows all things. Past, present, and future, even our most secret thoughts, words, and actions. Remember the picture of the soul and next to the body? God created that soul. It says he made it. He can see it. He's God. He can see and knows every single remember in the timeline. God knows what you were thinking when you were when you were five years old. He knows what you're gonna to think tomorrow. He knows what you're thinking when you're sinning. He knows what you're thinking right now. You can see it. You're his. He knows all the hairs on your head, every cell in your body. He knows it because he created it. Okay, so this is how much he wants us to get there is that he knows us far better than we know ourselves. He's all-knowing. He's all-knowing before his eyes are all secrets. Even the most hidden are clear. Even secrets will not be thought of by man till the end of time. Again, the idea of time. God knows the last man. He knows his secrets right now, as if they are happening now. Um, God knows us for what we are. So St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. God knows us for what we are. We cannot hide anything from Almighty God. All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we have to give account. Confessional is one of the most magnificent places that God has given us because the one who steps into the confessional recognizes. Right? He knows it all. He watched me. He saw me. He heard me. He saw my thoughts. I can't hide anything. I'm speaking to him. That's why when one comes in a confessional, one says, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Uh, it's been so long since my last confession. I accuse myself. He wants those words to come out. Our tongue has to say those words. I accuse myself. When those words come out from us, it's not that hidden one within us. The person who just goes, can't I just say to God, I'm sorry? Not good enough. It's still too hidden. It was by our words and our actions and our thoughts that we offended him. So by our words, we've got to get back and, and put it out of ourselves. We have to have those words come out. I accuse myself. That difficulty of being able to do that, which becomes less difficult the more you do it or the more you trust in God's grace. But he wants us to do it because he's seen it all anyway. Um, God all-knowing will one day make everything known to everybody. That's when it starts getting a bit uncomfortable disclosing our entire lives for all to read and know. Right, that's when the, the embarrassment really starts off, okay? Nothing will be hidden. At the end of time, we'll all be uncovered, which is why we must strive to continue to do good. God's going to uncover at the end of time, the final whistle, that's it. Everybody's going to get pulled out on the big field and everybody can see everybody else. Nothing is hidden anymore. God will pull it all out. The record will stand of every single thought, every single action that we did. And that's that idea of not one, all T's have to be crossed and all I's have to be jotted. It will all be seen at the end of time. Render an account, dear, dear. 
the day of woe. Alright, if we think of this power of God to see and know all things, and His promise to make everything manifest on the last day, we can more easily resist the temptation to sin. Luke 8, 8 17, For there is nothing hidden that will not be made manifest, nor anything concealed that will not be known. Last year I gave a homily on the, the Flathead tribe of Native Indians in Montana and um, Southern Alberta. And I talked about the work of Father Pierre de Smet amongst the uh, indigenous people and his conversion of the whole tribe. And that he worked with these people and they came to embrace the fullness of what Father had given to them and amended their lives, became warlike only in defense and started to live extremely virtuous lives, incredibly holy lives these people were able to live. But Father de Smet had to go away in order to bring you know, new provisions, he had to get more liturgical stuff, he had to try and bring more missionaries and more priests, so he would leave them and go away and say, I promise I'll tr I will try my best to be back in six months. And he had to you know, ride through hostile territory to get to St. Louis and then from St. Louis across to New York and then by ship back to Belgium and France and try and bring more people, more money. And he, said, he got back like two or three years later or something like that, okay, it happens. And then when he came along to the Flathead tribe and he said, right, they were overjoyed, we can have the big prayer now, thanks God, thank you God for your goodness. And the big prayer meaning mass. Father said, all right, I'm going to set up my confessional first, I've been away for so long, you have to have confessions first. And the chief of the tribe who said, I will lead my people, you have, God will put me in front, I will do it. I've been waiting all my life for the good God. And so he went first to confession. Father said, okay, chief, you can come first. And bless me, Father, uh, bless me, Father, for I have not sinned. Yeah, right on. Surely you've done something wrong. And your thoughts, you thought about something. And he said, Black Robe, for many years I was savage. I took the lives of many men. I lived a very ignoble life. You have brought to me the Creator who has given us all things and who wants us to be happy forever. Three years. Can we do three days? We have it all. It's just something if we knew that God is going to bring out all before us and reveal absolutely everything. Let's change our, our way of living our lives, okay? A wonderful story and a true story at that. Um, when we, what do we mean when we say that God is all present? Omnipresent. When we say that God is all present, we mean that He's everywhere, okay? His creation is the universe. Is all time of the universe. God's outside of it all. And therefore it's an, it exists because of him. Therefore he, he's everywhere. And when people say God is a tree. No God's not a tree. And when Christ says I am the vine and you are the branch. Well it doesn't mean he's got you know, leaves coming out of his ears or, or things like that. But his fingerprint is on all things that exist because they exist. Therefore his fingerprint is there. You know the moon's up there and it looks lovely. Oh isn't that nice. Okay, God's fingerprint. The fact that it exists means that God's fingerprint is there. God is all present because there is nothing that can have existence apart from Him. All creation exists in Him as though as thought exists in the mind too. There is no place that God is not. Um, Jeremiah 23-24 Do I not fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Acts 17-28 In Him we live and move and have our being. However, we must not make the mistake of thinking that God... <laughs> in whom everything exists is limited by this everything remember that's everything he's outside that there's no limit it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on and on he has no limits and exists outside as well of in all creation god is all present present everywhere at the same time he is not like man man cannot be in two places at the same time god is holy everywhere at the same time, through all time. The presence of God should be an incentive for us to do everything to please Him. Here's a, an aside. Isn't it interesting that people wait until it's dark and when they really want to sin? Turn off the lights. Don't want to be seen. As if you could hide from God somehow or other. It's just stupid. As if God needs an... Uh, uh, hang on, uh, who's that down there? <laughs> who's that? Uh, where are you, Adam? <laughs> where are you, Adam? I'm over here. Okay, it's a metaphor again. There's no way of getting away from it. But people do. People wait till dark to sin. 
unless you live at the North or South Pole. Um, the presence of God should be an incentive. As we are careful never to do anything wrong in the presence of our mother, at least we shouldn't be, how much more careful should we be in the presence of Almighty God? And from Jeremiah, Shall a man be hid in secret places and I not see him? Prophet Jeremiah is making that pretty obvious, okay? Man thinks in a secret place, you think I'm not seeing him? Duh. You know, those who commit crimes and think, Oh, no one's knowing about this. Duh. Just, it's, it's... Anyway, they end up in the same place. We all end up being judged. Although God is everywhere, we do not see him because he is a spirit and cannot be seen by our eyes. Similarly, we cannot see our own soul or that of another. God is spirit, and they who worship him must worship in spirit and in the truth of that is God. What do we mean when we say that God is almighty? When we say that God is almighty, we mean that he can do all things. Okay, so I put the question to you, put up your hand if you know the answer. Can God make a square circle? Because kids love to say that. If he's God, he can make a weight that God can't lift. He can make something so heavy that God can't lift it. Can God make a square circle? Is that a yes? Can God make a square circle? Yes or no? You think he can? God can make a square circle? No? Well, this is good. The word square and circle describe things. Thank you. Okay, do you hear the answer? No. The words square and circle are descriptive words. They describe something which is. A square has four equal sides, and a circle is something which goes in a, around and has no so, one side to it. They are descriptions. But God, therefore, would not be, he would not be following the rule of a circle, that he himself made the rule of a circle if he made something with four four sides and said that's now a square circle it's not therefore he's not following the rule that he made the circle god has created because god created the idea of circle god also created the idea of square therefore god would go against his own creation by making that which is circular and square in fact it would be something other than that okay so and also the weight so heavy that god can't lift it again impossible because all things are within god because nothing can be greater than God. So God can't create something greater than he himself because he is infinite. And the creature has to start. Okay, so again, it would be um, a word that opposes itself. A square circle opposes itself. It's like saying a left-right. It's either left or right. It's not left-right. Which way are you going? Left-right. So God can't create a left-right. It's just left and right now. Descriptions. Okay, the question? Yes, he's on the You can always If he makes a circle square, if he makes a circle square, it's not a circle. No, but if he makes a circle square, it's not a circle. It's a square. No, not necessarily. Well, yeah, these things are for the use of man, but it is a descriptive word. It's like saying God can make a black white. In other words, he can make something black white and still be black while it's white. They can't because they are opposites. One thing is either the color black, or which is no color, or one thing is white. So he can't be the same type. It is the principle of non-contradiction. So God can't contradict because he makes the thing itself. Okay? You know, we end up playing games with have words after a while. But <laughs> we are delving into things whereby it's no longer able to be put down in 1 plus 1 equals 2. We are going to, as we work our way through the book, we're working through basic philosophy and theology. And therefore we end up getting into places where we, we actually speculate. Because we can't weigh grace, for example. How much grace have you got? Lots. How much? Three kilos? $27.43 plus GST? You can't. Okay? It becomes speculative. It becomes spiritual. And they become sometimes supernatural. Way above our ability to understand. But we still have to speculate how they are. Because God hasn't revealed all things. He's revealed enough to get to heaven. But not all. We still try to understand. Um, Almighty. God can do anything by a mere act of will. Nothing is impossible to God, unless there's contradiction. Things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Luke 18, 27. The only thing God cannot do 
Unless you make a contradiction. You cannot will wrong. Because wrong is a contradiction of God's goodness. Okay? So that which God wills is good. If it gets messed up, it's not because God willed the wrong. God willed it to be done right. We are the ones who get it wrong, and that's how it eventually gets messed up. God's omnipotence or power is known to us especially by the magnificence of creation and by his miracles. So these two things, the, the, the creation itself, it's often said that some of the most strong believers in God are scientists who study things on the grandest or the smallest scale. Nuclear scientists, for example, microbiologists, because they start getting down and down and down and down and down and down, way beyond what the human eye can see, and they are seeing a complexity and an order in a scale so small that you start realizing this cannot be random. This is absolutely impossible that randomness can make this. A green blurge of something happens to just make this order, and then you start to realize this is ridiculous. And also on the grandest scale, you know, I'm seeing the moon just up there, and that's relatively speaking in the universe close, and yet it's exactly the right distance from Earth to affect our tides perfectly. And the sun is exactly the right distance from Earth in order to affect our weather so that we can look at random. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awful. And it becomes silly after a while when we start saying that this randomness is there, but God is, is, is fin his fingerprint is on all this, his omnipotent. So that's one way of us sort of getting the idea of God being there is by his creation. And the second is by his miracles, which he doesn't do all the time, but he does. And when he does do them, then we start to, whoa. Whoa, okay, all right, that's way beyond possible. And God has performed miracles throughout time. We will come to those. Uh, almighty. Um, yet God created all the immensity of the heavens with nothing except his word. Logos. Be light made, and light was made. Genesis 1 3. In the same way our, God, our Lord worked many of his miracles, that being Jesus worked many of, of his miracles. Great is the Lord, of his greatness there is no end, Psalm 144. Is God, next question, is God all wise, all holy, all merciful, and all just? Yes, God is all wise, all, all holy, all merciful, and all just. He's all wise. The more we learn of the wonders of the universe, the more we are amazed by, his infinite, by the infinite wisdom of God, by his almighty God. It is said that one of the things that is one of the most remarkable parts of the human body is the eye. And that when one starts to study the parts and how the eye works and everything, it is such, such an incredulity that we realize that we all have them. We sort of say, okay, yeah, I can see that. But it is just it's beyond our scope. No, man, we can't reproduce anything like it. And yet God just is just another part of our body. Again, part of his creation. And the wisdom behind the whole thing as well. His knowledge is infinite. He knows how to direct all things to the highest ends and by the most fitting means. God is infinitely holy in himself. He loves good and he hates evil. Therefore, he is also all just because he loves good and hates evil. He will punish the wicked, those who by their free will choose to do that which is wrong. Um, and he will reward the good. Those who by their free will choose to do the good. Be holy because I am holy, says the book of Leviticus. Partial justice is done in this life, but it's only partial. Who remembers Slobodan Milosevic? The Serbian strongman, okay? He died while in prison and people said, that's not fair, he's escaped justice. Rubbish. No one escapes God's justice. Okay, no, even the criminal, even the murderer, even the one who isn't caught in this life, no one escapes. But if they are caught in this life, they only get partial justice. They only get a little bit. They're incarcerated or they're hung or they're beaten up or something. But it's only a part of the justice. All the real justice comes with Almighty God. For often the good are happy and the wicked are tormented by their conscience, but sometimes it's the other way around. The good suffer in this life and the thieves and robbers have lots in this life. But complete, complete justice will not be accomplished until the next life. God is infinitely merciful. Okay, so his justice and his mercy are both infinite. 
He gives sinners time for repentance. He receives us back with joy when we repent. But merciful as he is, we must not presume on his mercy, for God will not be mocked. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy. Psalm 102. He is long-suffering, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. So that concludes at least this part. We have five minutes or four minutes <coughs> for Q&A on today's topic. So we'll ask about Super Bowl. Who's going to be in the All Blacks this year? So questions on that, on God's perfections, God's goodness, God's uh, Comprehensibility, God's innumerability, all is any any question? Yes. There's a question that I've always thought about. Yeah. Um, so if God is our final time, um, and at the end of time we will all be judged, yep. does that mean that we are all being judged right now? Like it's already happened, but we're still living with that? Okay, so the question is since God is outside of time and then at the end of the at the end of time we'll all be judged. Mm -hmm. By the, the public the general yeah. judgment. Yeah. Okay, so there are two judgments that all must go. At the moment of your death, you have your personal, and therefore it's called the particular judgment. The moment you die, you're judged in the particular judgment. And that's set for all eternity. Boom, there it is. But God just wants everybody to know that, okay, not only do we have that personal judgment, which will be either really good or really sad or really, or really good, but at the end of time, when the final whistle blows on the last play, the last thing of all, then... Every soul will be given back into their body, no matter where they are, where they are. Even the ones in hell are all going to come, and we'll all stand on the, the same playing field. And then there'll be the general judgment, and that's when even those who are in heaven, happy in heaven, knowing they're going to be happy, but then there is still that chain of their, their former sins which has to be shown to all, and that will bring everybody to their knees, so to speak, because no one, apart from the Blessed Virgin Mary, no one can stand upright at that general judgment. So you just got to have that sense, the particular and the general. And at the general, all will give homage to him because they will see the fullness of his perfections with regards to all. I mean, I want to meet my great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents. But I will see what they've done wrong and they will see what I've done wrong as well. And we'll all see what everybody else has done wrong. It'll be the great moment, a great tribulation that's called in the book of Apocalypse because everybody will just be fighting in the heart false to stand there as it will all become clear. But yet the, the particular judgment is final and, and it sets someone in the position of where they will be for eternity. But the general judgment will be the great trumpet call. The angels will drag everyone out. Everybody will see. And it, it is really to show God's majesty through his justice and through his mercy. Mercy for those who are saved. Justice for those who are damned. Does that sort of answer? Um, or is question, a question more particular? Related more to, because God is outside of time, yep. does that mean that the general judgment is happening? Like okay, alright, so the general judgment, which is at the end of time, is God's outside of God's already already knows what happens in the general judgment. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Because <laughs> he's outside of time. He knows. It's, it, it, it hasn't already happened, but for God it has. For us it hasn't. Yes. So, uh, if a new baby born, using the spirits of God, yes. Because so many baby born lives have been Yep. So God is spirits. Yes. And He knows them all perfectly. It's a, it's a, it's a brand new baby and brand new spirit. Yes. So the baby, the, the body of the baby comes from the mother and the father. They give it that body that will grow inside the mother's womb. But the soul is created. Each one, God created it. He knows it. It's his. He knows every single bit of that soul. He knows what will happen in its whole life. But he loves it because he created it. Do you remember, I don't know if it's still there, when I was a small kid, go to Motat. And in Motat, they used to have this number up on the, uh, somewhere inside Motat, and we'd click over, and it was a number of human beings on the planet. Do they still have it? Has anybody been to Motat in the last... <laughs> okay, uh, it was 45 years ago that I was there, and I remember there was, there was this number, and it was something like a billion. <laughs> it's like a billion people, but 
the last number was ticking over, like tick, tick, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and that was going, and that was the number of human beings who were coming into existence. That was the, the number of the human race. It was, it was quite interesting. I remember going, wow, it's a new person. Every, every second there's a new person. Imagine it now. Because now we've got seven billion. Okay, 6.5 billion now. So it, incrementally it's going faster. But every one of those souls, God not only has created, he's not putting them out like in a factory like that. He knows them perfectly and loves them. That's why he creates them. That's God cycled it, you know, the whole spirit. Never, never. Each one is individual and each one is new. And each one is unique, just like you are unique. He knows you and he knows you from the moment before he, he created you, he knew you. Because he lives outside of time. So he's not a cycle. Right? Never. Recycle. Never. Because the moment you die, then comes the judgment. And the judgment will fix you either in happiness or sadness. So there's no chance of coming back again. Okay? And many many religions had this idea. They sort of thought, well, surely something has to happen with us because God had not revealed to them what happened to them. The idea of judgment, of God's revelation to man. So for the self of you know, uh, my, uh, my friend, the name is uh, and actually she used the great, great answers as any thing, you know, I do. Right, see, like I said, many cultures believe in this idea of sometimes of connection with past spirits that talk to the past spirits and, and that they have something from one of their ancestors, which we do. We have the DNA passed on from our ancestors. But the soul never comes back in another way. Never. Yeah. It's just that God makes us. The soul is so unique. It is so magnificent. St. Teresa of Avila saw the soul of St. Peter of Alcantara in the moment that he died. And of course, God only put an image in her mind because we can't see the soul. But God gave her a great grace to see what what a human mind would see while seeing a soul. And she said it was so magnificent because it was filled with grace as well, because it was a very holy soul. And she nearly died with joy because she had seen this beautiful thing. Any other questions? Does time run in heaven and hell? Well, time definitely runs in hell. And time... Yes, it does run in heaven. Yeah, but God is outside even of that state of, of that of that of heaven. Yeah. So in, in other words, when you, a soul in heaven can't go back in time, but they can see back in time in God. We don't know whether God allows them to see forward in time. Probably not. But He allows them to see back in time in God, so they could see. The understanding of this is why the infinite inf infinity of God just goes on. You can see how the world was created, for example. You can see who um, who killed JFK. <laughs> who cares? I know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really care. Yeah. So, is anything between hell and heaven? No. There is a gap so great that nothing can cross ever. And that's written, and, and our Lord mentioned it in one of his parables. That there was a soul of one man in hell, and he was suffering. And he, and he saw away in the distance, he saw another man, the poor man, who was with Abraham, waiting to go to heaven, but waiting, they were, they were saved. He called out to him, Abraham, my father, please send that man to give me some water, just to give me one drop of water. And Abraham said, between you and me, there is a chasm, a gulf that can never be crossed. And this is God giving us a metaphor to say that those in hell can never have the connection. There is no... So it's no third party to heaven. It's, in, it's infinite. Purgatory is not in between, no. Purgatory is a state of cleansing. We can think of it of hell as hell with an ending, but it wouldn't be hell, because hell has no ending. Hell is eternally dark, eternally without any hope, and eternally without any goodness, without any God, without any charity. We get to that in the book, of course. Whereas purgatory has a light on. And no matter how much people are hurting in purgatory, the light's on. Yes, the light's on. And so you have that hope, because you can see the light. 
as you move towards it. Why would people in hell in town the general judgment be adoring God? Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that when we get to hell. Yeah. But they won't be they won't be the wrong word, they won't be adoring. They can't adore because an, an act of adoration is an act of love. And an act of love would be something that would make them have some good feelings. They can't. They would only have utter shame and, and desolation and have to be dragged there through it all and it would just be, it would be a calamity. Any other questions? I know there's probably millions. You guys have to get home and have dinner. It's 8.36. All right, so next week is February, whatever, what, next Tuesday, February the 5th. Oh, uh, yeah, Monday the, uh, the 5th, 7 p.m. through to 8.30. Hopefully we'll have some more of these books. Um, now, Maria's husband, Jose, has been trying to get the PDF of this. He's not here, but he's here next week, is he? So, and we're going to try and transfer that. If he brings his laptop, if you want the PDF of this book, or at least he got like two-thirds of it, didn't he? The first two-thirds of the book. Bring a thumb drive next week. And you can load, you'll be able to load onto your thumb drive a PDF of the book so that you, if you wanted to, you could use this for the book or print out some of your own or whatever you want. Okay? Sound good? And if you do want to buy these, and it is an excellent book, it's a hardcover, $60, eight more of them. Yeah, so it will be coming on Monday, uh, $60 each. <laughs> the online one we competed two weeks ago after the class. Yeah. Jose and I did a comparison between Father's hard copy and the online. Yeah. Yeah, there are three parts in this book. The Father's Holy, Father actually told us that there are three parts. The online version is short of, uh, four or five chapters short of completing part one. Okay, right. So they don't even have part two, part yeah, right. three. Yeah. And even part one is not complete. And also we found that that online PDF version was 1949. First edition. Well, wow. that one's 1954. Okay. Five years difference, and we see differences. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Maybe somebody can scan the whole thing and yeah. put it into a massive PDF, but I don't know how to downsize <laughs> those things. Some tech wizard can do that. All right. Let's say a prayer. For conclusion. The Lord's over in the, in the chapel. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was at the beginning, it's now. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was at the beginning, it's now. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was at the beginning, it's now. We give you a blessing. Benedict Sio Dei, Omnipotentis Patris, et Tiri, et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat, Superbos, et Maniat Semper. Amen. So by way of news to everybody, this coming Friday is the first Friday of February. Mass is in Otahu at St. Joseph of Joachim.